So thanks for coming. I want you to think back to the last time that you had a strain. And I want you to think back to how you did it, or how you think you did it, more importantly, and what happened when you had the strain. So when you strain a muscle, certain things will happen. I want you to think, though, back to a different strain now. Not the last strain that you had, but the worst strain that you had. So those are two different things, aren't they? So what I just did right there is kind of remind you that a strain in and of itself is a, it's a hard thing to define because there are strains that happen that are not that bad. And then there are strains that happen that are really bad. That will lay you up for literally months. So what I want to share with you today are what you can do to shorten the time from the time that you get the strain until the time that you're back moving. Things that you need to do in between to prevent making it worse, which you may not really understand that you're doing, that you think that you're helping, we're going to eliminate some things. And then also things that you can do that you may not ever even heard of before that are simple. And I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible for you to remember what those things are. So I'm going to use simple mnemonic devices, which are silly, but that usually sticks a little bit better, the things that aren't silly. I'm going to try to be as non-technical as I possibly can, <laughs> mostly from my benefit, <laughs> so I don't have to remember fancy words. But also because, again, it makes it easier to remember. But if there's a question that you have that lends itself towards the more technical, then feel free to ask the question, and I'll do my best to answer it. I don't promise to have all the answers to the questions. So when you're thinking back to this bad strain, I want you to think about what you think a strain is, because most people don't really understand what the actual strain is. It's not to say that you don't, but some people don't understand what actually a strain is and what happens when you have a strain. Most people relate the strain to the symptoms. So in the simplest terms, all a strain is is disruption or tearing of tissue. So something happens to cause tissue to literally tear. Did everybody know that already? Give me a yes or a no. 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 <laughs> some people do, some people don't know that that's what happens. It's a disruption of tissue. And it's specifically the collagen or the connective tissue in line with the muscle. Muscles are pretty gummy if you take a look at them. But it's the things that hold the muscles together, the collagen, the sheaths, the outsides of the fibers that wind up tearing, sometimes bad enough that the whole thing tears. Sometimes a tear is a uniform tear in a small specific area. Sometimes it's a diffuse tear in lots of different areas. So if you've ever overworked a muscle, if you've gone to the gym and hadn't worked out for a while or you're doing a new exercise, hamstrings are prone to it. If you do stiff-legged deadlifts or something like that where you get a really big stretch, or if you're doing flies with a pec machine and you get your chest a really big stretch, and then you just have kind of just a generalized achiness. And sometimes it's very point-specific. Have you experienced that? Yes or no? I hear some voices. Get some, get some activity in here. You got to communicate with me. This is a conversation. So, but it's all the same thing. It's a disruption of tissue. And the thing that happens after the tissue gets disrupted is your body then goes into repair mode. And one of the first things it does when those tissues are disrupted is our chemicals are released to the area that signal your body to do several things. And there's five things that happen. And the five things that happen are really important to remember. So the first thing that happens, everybody, know, everybody knows these because you've experienced them all. What, what happens? Pain. It hurts. So you go, ow. Second thing that happens or that could happen is, is that you can get some redness in the area. So you might literally see redness or discoloration in the area. And it can get warm. So has anybody ever had a strain that they tore tissue and it actually felt swollen and warm? Swelling also can happen, literally like a fluid collection in the area. And then the last thing that could happen of the five is that the muscles in the area in and around the strained tissues will go into what's called guarding or protective guarding. So they'll get tight. So that's exactly what happens. The reason that that's important to know, those five things that happen based on this chemical being released or these chemicals being released in the area due to that tissue disruption are the things that we then tend to say that's what we need to fix. So typically what people will do is they'll say, I strained a muscle and it, it's tight now. So what do people, what do you think people do to loosen? Stretch. They stretch. Or they'll say, it feels swollen and warm. So what do they do if it's swollen and warm? They put, they put ice on it. And they'll also say, um, it hurts to do anything when I do it. So I'm going to back off and I'm going to rest. 
Okay, and another thing that some people will do is they'll, they'll say, well, because it's swelling in the area, I'll, I'll elevate it. Okay, and so that goes, if you've ever heard the acronym RICE, right? You, I saw some people lipping it, RICE, right? Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So that's where that comes from. It's, so these are five symptoms, and people say, let's chase the symptoms away. We'll get rid of the warmth by putting heat on it. We'll get rid of the swelling, by, the warmth by putting the ice on it. We'll get rid of the swelling by putting ice on it. We'll get rid of the tightness by stretching the muscle. But how well do those things work? Fair to Midland? Okay, a little bit. The ice definitely cools the area off. May or may not help with the inflammation in terms of the actual swelling of the area. How good does stretching work? Probably counterintuitive. I mean, probably counteractive because they're tight. The muscles are tight, so you're stretching, it might make it work. Right off the bat. Interesting. Has anybody actually done it? Has anybody ever strained a muscle and then stretched it? Has anybody ever had a, you have. And what, and what happens? It didn't get better. It doesn't get better. Okay, so those five things that happen based on that inflammation, the chemicals that are happening coming to the area, are there to try to help your body heal. So it would be akin, the stretching would be akin to me saying, I'm gonna give you a baby, I would like you to hold my baby. And I say, hold the baby, don't drop the baby, because that would be bad for the baby. And then I come over to you and I go, okay, hold the baby, and then I start yanking on your arm because <laughs> you're so tight over there in the area, right? And you're just gonna do what? You're gonna tighten right back up. So if, if the things that are happening, if those five things that are happening are happening because they're protecting your body and you try to undo those five things too aggressively, then your body will kind of whiplash and go in the other way and actually start to do more of those things. So you'll stretch and then it'll get, five minutes later it'll get tight again or it'll be immediately tight and it'll also probably be really uncomfortable. So I wanna talk through why those things happen but I also wanna to get to the source. The reason it's important for me to have shared that with you is now that you know those five things is I have a three step system that I'm gonna share with you to undo the problem and you'll have a philosophy, a framework to work with so that the next time that you have a strain or if you're working with a client that has a strain you'll be able to help them work backwards because I'm gonna tell you what the number one problem is when it comes to the strain. The number one problem is that your body is overly aggressive in its response to try to heal you. So the amount of inflammation, the amount of discomfort that you feel is an exaggeration because we have the ability to override that and do things like say, I'm gonna stretch when if your body could talk back with you, it would say, don't do that. That's not a good idea. I'm holding it in place for a reason. But it is an overreaction because it knows, in a sense. I don't I mean it knows. But we're built to overreact because that's how the body helps us get to where we go. But sometimes what happens, if again, you think back to your worst strain ever, is sometimes it takes a really long time to get better. Much longer than we think that it should and probably much longer than it needs to. So at the root, I said something earlier, after the tissues get disrupted, there are chemicals that are released in the area and that's just called inflammation. Those are chemicals of inflammation, there's lots of them. Some of them are specifically built to be irritants so that they make you feel pain, so they're little irritants. Some of them are specifically built to cause blood flow in the area to either be more aggressive or less aggressive and bring white blood cells in to clean up the area. So the thing that we need to address at the root of it, if we wanna get rid of all those things, the guarding, and the redness, and the heat, and the swelling, all of those things that I talked about, is to get rid of and manage the inflammation. Okay, if the inflammation is at the root of all of those things, then less inflammation will also reduce all of those things. Does that make sense? So how do we get rid of some of the inflammation? That's what I wanna to talk to you about. It's gonna kinda of be at the, at the core of it, and then, and not get rid of it 100%, because you need it to heal. So we don't wanna eliminate it, we need to keep a little bit of inflammation in there because that's what's gonna stimulate the tissues in one sense to heal. It has to have that environment. But there are other things that we can do as well. So I'm gonna talk through them and this is where the mnemonic comes in, okay? So the, I want you to remember the letter T, okay? T, because it's gonna be three things that I'm gonna share with you and three starts with the T. That's my first mnemonic for you. <coughs> three with a T. Okay, so the three things, the first of the three is gonna be tame it. Tame it, T-A-M-E, tame it. So we wanna tame the inflammation down. So here's how you're gonna tame the inflammation. The first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna stop doing things that make the inflammation get worse. 
Okay? So anything that hurts is going to be a signal to you that you're challenging the tissues in a way that's too aggressive. So what are some things that challenge tissues too much? If you had a, a hamstring strain, what are things that could make it worse? Start just shouting them out at me. Keep utilizing that you're still lifting weights with your leg and you're walking or hiking. Any of your normal activities that hurt, right? Okay, so normal activities that hurt. So literally, if walking hurts, then probably you should be doing a little less walking. Or if there are specific exercises or activities that you do that cause an increase in the pain, you shouldn't do that. If stretching hurts, then you probably shouldn't stretch. That doesn't mean you can't do anything. Now, what's the other side of it? I said if it's painful, what can you do? Anything that's not painful. Anything that's pain-free, you can do. That's OK. That's, that's acceptable. So the first thing is, is to eliminate the stuff that's hurting. So don't do stuff that hurts. It sounds so logical. It sounds so reasonable, like, oh, that's kind of, yes, I would never do things that hurt. But we do it all the time. And, and we, you know, we're like, oh, I need to push past the pain. I'm being wimpy. This has been hurting for too long. I'll, I'll just do it anyway. There is, pain is interesting because people think of pain as a tunnel. And if they just push a little harder, they'll get through to the other side. There's no other side of the tunnel of pain. It's a ditch that you're just digging a hole. You just keep getting down. You have to climb out. It's a just a, so don't do that. So pain-free is the first way to tame things. Then there are actually proactive things that you can do to tame things as well. The first I want to talk with you about is just some nutritional stuff that you can do. Because inflammation is based on chemicals. And chemicals get manufactured in your body based upon the materials that are available to it. So when you're eating certain foods or taking certain supplements, then your body has different chemical reactions based upon those foods or those supplements or those medicines. So if you're taking an anti-inflammatory, for example, like ibuprofen, then what that does is it works in your gut to block your body from manufacturing a specific type of set of chemicals so aggressively. So that can help, actually. That can help reduce some of the inflammation. Some people don't like taking ibuprofen because it's aggressive on your stomach or people like taking more natural things. So there are alternatives. A couple of alternatives I'll just throw out are uh, turmeric, which is uh, it's, it's a, a root, I think. It comes from like a ginger kind of a root. And it has something inside of it called curcuminoids, which are active to help inhibit inflammation. Works in kind of similar pathways as ibuprofen, but a little less uh, harsh on the system. Boswellia, anybody ever heard of Boswellia? Yeah. And so that has something called five loxin in it, okay, which is the active component of it. And that can also help with anti-inflammation. And again, it's just something that you can get at a health food store, a natural store. And you can take those. These are not things that you want to take long term because, again, they are still are anti-inflammatories. They will affect your gut over long periods of time, but they're natural. And then fish oil, just uh, actually EFAs, essential fatty acids, can be helpful in altering the chemical pathways of your body so that your body isn't so good at manufacturing inflammation. Sometimes if you ever had a cold, sometimes if you have a cold, I don't drink dairy products, but, uh, but if you did have a really, really bad cold and decided to get a, you know, a nice cup of whole milk and chug it down, I think most people will find that subsequently they'll wind up with more congestion, more flemminess for having had the glass of milk because there's stuff in milk that helps your body manufacture those chemicals and it gets more gunky. So it's a good idea then, if you're going to take some supplements to alleviate some of the inflammation, it's also a good idea to avoid foods that might promote inflammation. You can look this up. Just go online, Google it, anti-inflammatory diet, and you'll find that there's a list of foods. And, and quite frankly, most of us already know what those foods are. And if you don't know what they are, they're things to play with. Some people are reactive and sensitive to things like lactose or glutens. Some people are reactive and sensitive to just simple sugars. But cleaning up your diet, getting rid of the saturated fats in the diet, for example. So let's go back to now, let's pretend that this is not you, but pretend like if you're working with clients who are suffering from a strain, what a great opportunity to introduce them to some nutritional concepts that are probably good to stick with anyway afterwards during this time when they're trying to get rid of the inflammation and the pain to educate them because now they're motivated. So two weeks ago when there was no strain and you were talking to them about a gluten-free lifestyle, no motivation. Today, maybe they'll go, oh, well, I kind of like walking. So I think maybe I will consider giving it a shot. And then they get an opportunity to see how that works. Does that all make sense? So the first thing is tame it. So ice can work. We've talked about ice. 
Here's a trick with ice, okay? And I want you to think about this as a thought experiment. I grew up in New York, and we had a lot of snow in New York. And when I was little, we used to go outside and not put gloves on because we were kids. And we would play with snow and get snowballs and stuff. And so the, the, when you first start playing with snow or something very cold, if you were to stick your hand in a bucket of ice or into a pile of snow and then count to 60 seconds and then take it out, what color would your hand be after about 60 seconds? Anybody have any idea? Red. Not yet. What happens first? White. It turns white first. <laughs> so the first thing that happens is you stick your hand in and your body has a vasoconstriction response. That means the blood vessels go, they get small, and the blood is not sent to the area because it's cold. And so that's the original response. Then, though, if you were to stick your hand back into the ice or snow and leave it there for another couple of minutes and then pull it out, then what color is it? Beet red, this bright, shiny red. What's happening then? Why? Right. So let's pretend that we have an area that has damaged tissue where you're not moving it very well. So there's not a lot of active pumping going on. And we put some ice on the area, and we leave it long enough so that when we take the ice off, it's red. And you just said there's more or less blood there. More blood. How's that blood going to get out of there? Anybody have any idea? It's not. It's going to dissipate eventually as things kind of get back to normal temperature. But originally, the blood's going to get shunted to the area. So there's going to be excess fluid in an area where there's already excess fluid. Does that sound like a good or a bad thing for a swollen, irritated space? Bad. That's a thumbs down. But what, what did I say earlier is if you put the ice on or stick your hand in the ice for one minute or so and it turns white, that's not a bad thing because that means there's less blood being shunted to the area. So if you're going to ice, how long should you ice for? A minute. About a minute or two. And how do you know that it's the right amount of time? Simple. I just gave you the answer. You look at the skin, and if it's what color is good, if it's white, it's okay, and if it's... Red is not so OK. So if you're going to ice, that's how long you ice. I, and it's going to be a minute for some people, and two minutes for others, and three minutes, and two minutes and 20 seconds. I don't know. Some people are different than others. Circulation and response and sensitivity. I personally don't like ice. Ice is cold. <laughs> so so <laughs> you don't ice, because it's uncomfortable. So if it's uncomfortable, what I say the first thing is, is don't do stuff that's painful. So if it's uncomfortable, don't do that. But if you like it, if you happen to be one of those a little freaky people who like to have ice on their limbs, whatever, then put the ice on for a short amount of time, and then just check, and just take the ice off and check to see what the color is. And if it's white, you're good to go. And then you can wait until it returns to normal color and normal temperature. And then if you like the ice, then you can, and whatever that point is, you can do it again. So now we have some tools for taming it. So we can tame it through anti-inflammatories. We can do it through an anti-inflammatory diet. We can avoid pain, avoid activities that irritate it. And we can use modalities like ice, for example. You can also, just to throw a little extra things in there, you can, you can use topical uh, creams and lotions that are potentially anti-inflammatory as well. They need to be able to penetrate through the skin barrier. So that's important. Um, Over-the-counter things that I have heard are effective. Again, I'm not telling that you should or shouldn't use these, but these are things to look into. Things like uh, some, this is old school. It's called DMSO, okay, which stands for like dimethyl sulfoxide something something. <laughs> right? I said I wasn't going to get technical, so I just lied a little bit. There's also uh, emu oil, which is literally oil from an emu. I don't know how they squeeze the emu to get the... <laughs> And then there's also prescription drugs uh, that are based on something called diclofenac sodium, which is a very small chemical molecule that does get through the skin. There are aspirin creams. I don't think aspirin's small enough to actually get in or not. Then there's icy hots and those kind of things. So those are more like topical irritants or they kind of make it feel cool, but they're really not actually cooling the area in, a, in an ice sense. So, but if it makes it feel good, those are OK with me. Right? The pain's bad. Anything that makes it feel good is OK. Here's a warning, though, when you're taming things, is we don't want to tame things too aggressively. In part, we don't want to tame them too aggressively because we don't want to halt this process from happening. That's very important. But also, there's another reason, is, is that if you halt it 
too aggressively, if you get rid of the pain, if we stole some lidocaine from somebody and injected it in and it was completely pain free, then what would we do? We'll go use it, right? We'll be like, it's better. It feels better. I'm good. I'm good now. I took pain medicine or I got rid of it. And then we'll go do the activity. And the signal that our body is giving us not to do those things is gone. And so we'll probably cause more damage. So it's not a bad thing to have a little bit of pain. It's a bad thing to have a lot of pain. I don't think there's any good reason for a lot of pain. But it's a good thing to have a little bit of pain. So be careful that you're not being so good at getting rid of the pain that you don't have any pain and then go do stuff that you shouldn't be doing. So use that signal. So th that was the first thing. So the first T is what? Tame. Tame it. The second thing that I'm going to share with you is you may have heard of it, you may have seen it. I'm going to show you how to use it and why to use it, and it's tape it, T-A-P-E. We're going to tape it. May I have that tape? So I've got some tape. And I use a brand called Rock Tape, R-O-C-K. You can go to Rock Tape to go get it. Or you can use any kinesiology tape that you like if you already have one. I like the rock tape because I've been using it for a long enough amount of time that I noticed that it doesn't irritate my patient's skin and it stays on a good long time. So it'll stay on for four days and then when you peel it off it doesn't leave residue and it doesn't cause irritation. So you know, I can't speak to the other brands because I, I don't know how they do, but if you found a brand that works for you, fantastic. As far as I'm concerned, they all work well. I'm not going to go into the mechanisms of how this works. Let's just call it magic tape for now. <laughs> okay. But I'll explain to you the, what happens when you use it, and I'll also show you the how to use it. So the tape really is all about doing two things. One is the tape is about helping to support good circulation in the area when there's not. So here's what happens when the swelling piece happens. If you strain an area and there's actually pressure and then there's the muscle guarding going on in the area, those two things can happen so aggressively that they literally like compromise the circulation in the area so that the good stuff's not getting in and the bad stuff's not getting out. So we want to calm that down. We did a little bit of that with the tame. What the tape's going to do is, is it's going to provide a little additional support system to help manage some of that inflammation in the area. If you want to see something really interesting, then I would like you to go to Google. Go to Google Images and just type in kinesio tape and then the word bruising or bruises. And then just look at what pops up. I'm going to let you do that yourselves, but it's pretty amazing if you haven't seen it. I'm going to just leave that as like a little teaser, like, a, ooh, what, is that? what happens at that point? But go check it out because it's really cool. And it is a cool thing to, to see for yourself to go, wow, that's pretty remarkable. It's just a good convincer because I, I can't show it to you now because I can't make it happen that fast. But I'm going to show you one of the techniques that they use. It's super duper easy. And then I'm going to show you another technique. Now, the tape is used in a lot of different ways. If you've seen people with tape on, they typically have like four or three long pieces that start at the shoulder and go down to their hand. It's on the back side and the front side. I'm going to say something now that the tape companies aren't going to appreciate, but you will because tape costs money and you're probably going to have to use a lot of it. Smaller pieces of tape work well if you use it the way that I'm going to show you how to use it. I'm not selling tape. I don't care how many rolls of tape you use. They do. So they come up with these awesome, cool designs that look really cool that use a ton of tape. Just, a, just whoo, whoo, these swooshy patterns. You don't need to do the swooshy patterns. If you feel like you want to put the swooshy patterns on, go ahead and do it. But you don't need the swooshy patterns. This is about as long a piece of tape as I ever use. Okay, And I don't know, that's probably five or six inches, something like that. And, and I'll go as small as two or three inches. All we're looking for is a response. And so that's what I want to show you. So I'm going to need somebody to volunteer that has uh, like an arm exposed or something who will volunteer for me. You're going to come and volunteer? You don't have an arm exposed. <laughs> So come on up, and we're going to pretend that she has strained her tricep. She was doing something, and she strained her tricep. So in order, now let's have you turn backwards, good. So there's two things that could happen when there's a strain, OK? There could be a very local or a focal strain. So it could be like at the origin or the insertion. 
Sometimes what happens is the strains will happen in the middle of the muscle, again, more diffuse, and sometimes they'll happen towards the ends, depending upon what you were doing when you got the strain. It could happen at the very, very top or the very, very bottom where things attach. So I'm gonna show you the two different techniques that you can use for the top or the bottom with the long tape, and then a technique that you can use with this little kind of feathered tape if it's kind of towards the center. Hold that for me, we're gonna do this first. So the first thing is, is we're gonna, the tape is very stretchy, so we're gonna set the tape on in a way that allows us to get a good stretch, okay? It's really, really easy to do. If you've ever used a Band-Aid, then you know how to use tape. When the muscle involved is strained, we wanna put it into a, a, a stretched position, not a shortened position. So the shortened position would be to have our arm back here. That bunches everything up. If I want it in a stretch position, then I'm actually gonna bring it the other way, and. Her, she has a shoulder problem, so we'll turn around. <laughs> we're going to turn around and use this arm. We're going to go like this, so we're stretching it here, and then we're going to bend the elbow, and now we have a fully stretched position. So this is where her triceps will be maximally stretched. Okay. Then I'm going to take the tape, and I'm going to tear it, So let's say about a thumb's width, and I'm going to just tear directly across, and I'm going to fold one piece down here like a Band-Aid, and I'm going to take the other piece off so that it's just exposed. That's for you. It's a parting gift. <laughs> then I'm going to take the tape and I'm going to set it. And I typically start at the most distal point. So I'm going to go to where her tendon attaches to her elbow up here. And I'm going to flatten it down for a couple of inches. And then I'm just going to peel the tape off. And I'm going to leave about, again, that finger width at the end. And I'm going to stretch it along the area. And I give it a pretty aggressive stretch, but you can go super duper light if it's a super duper sensitive area. If the strain's bad, she's not gonna be able to get in this position anyway. She might be somewhere down here. Okay, but if it's, if she can get to a full stretch, we'll get to a full stretch. I'll stretch the tape, and then I'll let it rebound a little bit back so that I'm at about a 50% stretch. Set it down, put the tape down. I've got my tag end, which is the free end over there, and then I'll just flatten that down, and then I'll just rub it on. And I typically will rub my hands together to make it warm because heat activates the tape and it'll make it stay on longer. Make sure all the edges are down. If you notice, I rounded the edges. So when you cut the tape, it's just gonna be square. I actually clip the edges. That way the likelihood of it peeling up is smaller. I think it's a good idea if it's gonna be on for three or four or five days. And set it down and then relax it down. And we're done with the taping. And what that does, okay, so one, if you'll turn back around, I don't know if the camera can see it or if you can see it, but there's a kind of a wrinkly effect that happens to the tape. Because I stretched it and she was stretching and then when we let go and rebound, it pulls back and it causes this little wrinkly effect, which does two really important things. The first thing it does is it creates this wrinkle in literally the skin. It causes a little bit of a lift of the skin and that allows for a little lymphatic channel to happen. It's a very small channel. It's not 50% increase in circulation. It's actually something like point 05 or some tiny little fraction of a number of increase in circulation. But in an area where there's compromise, in an area where there's a really difficult time with circulation, any little bit helps. And once that starts helping, it starts creating this kind of a ramp effect where that little bit that helps allows your body to then get rid of some of the fluid that lets the normal system start working. So it's kind of a little jump start to the system for anti-inflammation. The second thing that it does is that it, it sends a signal through the skin to the underlying tissues because they're all innervated by the same stuff. So the nerves that are in that area don't know where the signal is coming from. It's like when you have an itch and you scratch the itch, you're just sending a signal through the skin and it causes a response. The tape sends a signal through the skin and it causes a response. And the response that we're looking for is, is it lets this muscle back here relax a little bit so it doesn't feel so tight and guarded. And you'll literally feel this within the first minute that you put the tape on. Literally the, fir the first minute. You'll go, I feel that. You have to experience it to, 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 uh, to actually know what I'm talking about. But it's pretty remarkable to feel, to go, ah, oh, there's just immediate sense of relief. If you don't notice an immediate sense of relief and it's not bothering you, then just trust me and do it anyway. <laughs> but what most people will find is, is that if they're not really in tune with their body and they're not very sensitive, they'll put it on, they might not notice anything. And then about a day or two later, they'll just go, ah, this isn't doing anything. And they'll take it off and then they'll go, oh, no. <laughs> I should have left that on because that felt good. It feels bad now. So they noticed that as a differential. I could have also put the tape if the strain were a little bit higher up. I could have put it a little higher up. So what we want to do is cover the area. That's the most important thing. 
And if it's literally a central um, piece, then don't worry about the ends. Just kind of stretch it, boop, pop it on, and do it in the center. So that's one taping technique. Now I'm going to rudely take the tape off. Shouldn't be too bad. It peels right off. Oh, just a couple of tips with the tape is um, when you take it off, do peel it off. It's not like a Band-Aid. You don't do the one, two, three pull. If you have hair, then it's a good idea to not have hair. Just shave the area first, right? If you're a woman that has hair, I don't want to really know about it. But just shave the area and then put the tape on or suck it up. But then when you take it off, hair, some hair is going to come with it. Another thing is, is that when the, t the tape is heat activated, um, it is harder to take off. So af after you take a bath or a shower, you want to take the tape off. I would wait until it dries because it is definitely stickier after you've done that. We're going to trade. Thank you. So now to do this, this kind of weavy pattern, which you'll see when you do that Google search that I showed you before. So I've taken a couple little strips and I've cut them into little three pieces. You can buy pre-cut pieces like this. They're just a lot more expensive because you're too lazy to cut with the scissor. So I just cut them. So, and I made two that are kind of identical because we're going to do a little, little weave pattern. So let's say that the bruise, again, is right in the center. And this works fantastic, by the way, for bruises and black and blues. So if you literally have a discoloration of the area, this is a great thing to use to, uh, to get rid of that. So hold one for me, please. And I'm going to tear off the top piece so that I did just like before. And then I'm going to fold down these little fingers so I can get them out of the way. Oop, that one's going to be trouble. There we go. And I'm going to put each one of these down so that I can get each little individual piece out of the way. And we're going to put them on one piece at a time. <coughs> And then I'm going to set the top piece, which is the tag end, so that the finger part, these little fingers, the center of the bruise is going to be kind of where my finger is right there. So I'm going to put it literally over there. So I'm going to find, let's say the bruise is right there. I'm going to put this above. And then I'm going to take the center piece, and I'm going to give it a light stretch, just about a 10 or 20% stretch, and set that down. And I'm going to do that feathering out each of these little fingers on the side, just like a little fan, and make a cool little pattern that looks just like that. Okay, And then I'll do the same thing I've done before as I just rub it down. I'll trade you again. Thank you. This time I'll try to be quicker. How long do you leave the tape on? Like three days? Three, four days, yeah. Shower with it. Shower with it, bathe with it, it's a great question. Yeah, you can leave it on. Take it off if it's itchy. Take it off if it doesn't feel good for any reason. But if it feels good or you're not feeling anything, then go ahead and leave the tape on. And I'm just going to do a crosswise pattern. Now, again, thinking the bruise is kind of in the center here, I'm going to put this to the side. And then I'm going to go to the center. And I'm going to pull this one across and over. And then this guy across and over. And then this guy across and over. And it's kind of a little bit of a mesh pattern. So if you can turn around so everybody can see what that looks like. Cool little weave pattern. Okay. And again, all we're trying to do is maximize the amount of area that's covered because the flat piece of tape doesn't do as good of a job. But in a pinch, it's just fine. You can just do an X pattern or you should use one piece. This is a little bit more meticulous, but this tends to work really well because it covers that more diffuse area. And it does help get rid of the bruising really quickly and does help with the the pain and inflammation. So you can have a seat. Thank you for joining us. So number two of the T's was? OK, the last thing. Oh, that's a good question. What I tend to do, it's an excellent question. So, some, like we said at the very beginning, some strains don't last that long. Some bruises don't last that long. So I usually will have a patient, or I'll put it on myself, for about three days or four days. And then I'll take it off and let it breathe for about a day, unless I'm in a really lot of pain. And then I'll put it right back on. If I'm in, and I had an injury uh, a year or two ago where I, I had a bad, bad elbow injury. And I, that thing was on. I think I had tape on consecutive days for uh, three months. And I had literally zigzags from the tape pattern in my arm. You know, after I took it off, and I had to use a lot of lotion and stuff, but I didn't care because it helped that much. So in a pinch, again, do what you got to do. But if, you, if it's not that bad and if you're kind of getting through it, typically after the first 
four days or five days um, of a normal strain, things will start to reduce significantly, and then you can back off on it. But you can retape, reapply. I usually like to give it 24 hours, let the skin breathe for a little bit, put some lotion on it, and just kind of let it settle for a little bit, and then put the tape back on. And of course, if you're using some of those topicals that I mentioned in the first part, then you're going to have to have some time off with the tape to put some of the topicals on. You might actually reapply the tape daily. You might put the tape on after you've let that lotion or the whatever the anti-inflammatory is, put the anti-inflammatory medicine on. A little bit later, come back, put the tape on, make sure it's dry. You don't want it with lotion because it'll peel right off. Okay, um, And then take it off and then reapply. Or you can just apply the lotion uh, or the, the anti-inflammatory cream on the outsides of the, because it'll still suck into the skin. But it's an excellent question. So again, I would just like a, it's, a, it's a rinse and repeat type of a process. Something I didn't mention earlier in terms of the process is, is that inflammation is chemicals in the air, and your body will clear that, those chemicals up. But they'll also kind of get rid of themselves after a little while, meaning that they'll kind of break down. And it's called half-life, half-life of some of the swelling materials in the air that make it really poofy. So that just means if I had uh, a, a, a magic bowl of jelly beans, that I put in my kitchen that was filled, the half-life of the jelly beans would be the amount of time it would take for half of the jelly beans to disappear. It depends on how much you like jelly beans. But let's say that the jelly beans magically disappeared by half in two days. So you would leave the jelly beans in the kitchen, and you'd come back after two days, and it would be now half full instead of full. And then you'd leave again, and then come back after two days, and then it would be a quarter full instead of full. So every two days, half of whatever's there is going to go away. And that happens with one of the specific types of chemicals of inflammation that's in your body. So if you're a fast healer, somewhere around two days, half the inflammation is going to wind up going away. If you're a slow healer, it's going to take closer to seven days for half the inflammation to go away. That just has to do with your metabolism, your body's ability to heal. So I want to share a rule. I know I'm breaking up my T's, but I'm going to share a rule because it's important is that there's, I have a two to seven day rule for, what, for what's going on in your body. And let's just make it seven to default on the side of safety. So a seven day rule. So my seven day rule is this, is if you're doing everything that you can to get rid of the pain and the inflammation to promote the healing, and you're feeling good after the second day or the third day, keep doing what you're doing. Stick with it. Don't change anything. If you're taping it, keep taping it. If you're taking something orally, then take the thing orally. If you're staying away from a specific activity or exercise that you know is painful or irritating, stay away from that activity. Even if you're feeling good, which most of us, what do we do? The first day we're feeling good, right back at it. It's, uh, I'm feeling good today. I've been in the gym in three days. I'm going back in. And whammo, right back to the beginning. So it's a setback. So wait for seven days. Be patient. Worst case scenario after seven days is if you're a slow healer is 50% of the inflammation will have calmed down. That's pretty significant. Best case scenario, that will have happened several times, three and a half times. The first two days, half will go away. The second two days, another half will go away. The third two days, another half will go away. And then in that one day, a little bit more will go away. So seven days later, you'll have almost 95% of the inflammation gone if you're a quicker healer, which is that significant. That next day, day number eight, you can make a change. Day number eight, you can say, today I'm going to stop taking the ibuprofen because I don't really want to take the ibuprofen. Today I'm going to try maybe not taping it and see how it feels. If you have a good eighth and ninth day, then you don't have to go back to the thing that you were doing before, unless you want to. You can start adding an activity back in. Add slowly. Add slowly. If you're going back to the gym, do a little bit. Test the waters. But if you have a good day, then test the waters a little bit more the next day. Though if you have a bad day on the eighth day, if on the eighth day, you go back and do the thing, you take away the anti-inflammatory, and it wrecks you, that should be a good signal to you that it's much more severe than you thought it was in the first place, and that that was a temporary alleviation at best, and you're not better. OK, does that make sense? The last thing, the last T, back to the T's. That was a, like a commercial break. <laughs> the last T, well, so what are the first two T's? OK, and the last is tense it. T-E-N-S-E, -E, tense it. That doesn't mean get stressed over it. It means that you're literally going to start generating tension in the tissues that have been disrupted. Gentle tension. So the main thing for generating tension is pain-free. Pain-free. So how do you know if something's pain-free? In other words, how do you know what to do? 
So if you strain your biceps and it hurts to bend your elbow to just flex your arm, I said hurts, right? So that's painful, then you can't do that. But I just said that you need to tense it. So how do we tense it if you can't really move it? We have to find a way to do it. So there's lots of ways to get there. The first and easiest way to do it is I can just help it. It's because my arm weighs what it weighs, but I can make it weigh a little bit less with my other hand, and I can just gently kind of assist. And that might not hurt so much. Or it might not hurt if I get my elbow to here, then it might not hurt if I do this, so I can shorten the range of motion. And maybe this little motion doesn't hurt, but if I go past here, maybe, ah, that's when it starts to bother it. Going back to the beginning of what originally injures the tissue is a disruption of the tissue, and it happens through two things. And it could be a combination of these two things or just one of these two things. The first thing is it could just be a stretch of the tissues. So if I pull hard enough on anything, it'll start to tear the tissue. And if I tense hard enough, if I contract hard enough, I can also disrupt the tissue. So generating a contraction of the muscle causes tension, and then stretching the muscle causes disruption. So sometimes the position, like if I were doing a uh, biceps curl, but I were doing it on an incline bench so that my elbows were behind my body, right? And then my arms are getting full stretch. This is a giant stretch of my biceps. And if I had a cable behind me and I were curling from this position, I'm curling under maximum stretch and tension and have to generate a pretty good bit of force to get it to actually bend. Versus if my elbow were in front of my body, now it's not really stretched. So I don't have as much internal tension, that passive tension. I could still put a heavy enough weight to strain it, but it's not those two factors combined. So usually it happens when you have a combination of the giant stretch of the muscle and then a pretty significant amount of tension that causes the disruption. So the opposite of that is, is to minimize the resistance and to minimize the stretch. And that decreases the tension on the tissue. So sometimes putting the tissue into a shorter position like for my biceps, bringing it a little bit higher, setting it on a table, and then curling from here, a lot easier. And also you'll notice that the resistance from my arm from here up disappears when I get to here. Actually, when I get to this point and my arm bends, gravity's actually going that way. I'm not actually using my bicep to pull down, it's just letting it fall, but I'm getting an, uh, an eccentric contraction of my biceps just to shorten, just to bring it there. So I can actually, if I could get my arm upside down, like I were doing a tricep extension, and then lowering my arm, my bicep is actually maximally shortened in this position, and I don't have to use any concentric contraction of my biceps to shorten. So I can actually get some tension through my biceps by just positioning myself this way. Can you think how you might do that with the hamstrings? Who would like to volunteer for a thought experiment? Give me somebody. I'm going to point to somebody if you don't. Good. Come on. I was going to pick you anyway. So, I, so come on over here. So how, how would you contract your hamstrings? How would you get a, a ham? Just think of a way. Yeah, like a curl. You just get a curl. So when you're doing that curl, how could we make it easier? How could we make it easier on your hamstring versus Bring just standing? Fantastic. So I bring the knee up, and I'm, sh I'm shortening it a little bit here, but I'm also lengthening it a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So can you think of another way that I might make it a little bit easier? To bring the leg back? No. no, no. That might make it a little bit sh no. harder, because then you have to lift against tension. How about, right. if you, how about if you lay down okay. on your stomach? Or how about? Do you want me to get on the ground now? <laughs> yeah, let's get a mat. We have mats, don't we, somewhere in here? Yeah, here. Grab a mat. Oh, they're on the wall. Good. So let's set it down. Lay down on your tummy. All right. Now bend your knee. So when we get up to here, there's no resistance, right? So it's like same as the biceps. When she's curling from here, she's getting some tension through it. Then the further she goes out this way, then tension starts to get added in. Now let's pretend that we said, tell me when it hurts, and we brought it down to here, and she said, okay, that's it, I start, I'm starting to feel it. So I would take a little bit of the tension off. I could literally hold my hand right here and just say, curl up from there, and then come back down until you feel my hand, and then curl up from there. So I've just done a partial range of motion leg curl. 
right? And that's generating tension. As that gets easier, then I can move my hand further away. If she doesn't have somebody to hold her, their hand there, she could do this against a wall or put an ottoman or a block so that she's supported there. Find the range of motion that works and do repetitions just like this. If, what if we wanted to make it, though, even easier than that? What if we want to make it easier than that? Want me to show you a cool way to do that? Mm -hmm. OK, we're going to use a ball. Ideally, we'd be using a table, but I don't have a table, so we'll use a ball. And I want you to put your leg so that your thigh is on here. Oh, and then lean forward. The yeah, cross the ball. Good. We're going to be creative. Scoot yourself forward. OK. So if we were doing a curl, she can do the same thing on the ball this way. But now I actually want you to turn the other way. Go out so that you're facing the opposite direction. So you're going to turn over. Yep, turn over and sit on the ball. Good. And scoot back so that your legs. So, no, just sit on it. Good. Right to there. OK. Hamstrings back here. How about if you just straighten this leg out? What's happening to the hamstring when we straighten the leg out? It's getting longer. So we're getting tension on the hamstring by getting a quad contraction. And then when you relax down, is she getting any pull or tension on the way? No. You're using your quadriceps muscle, but you're getting that same eccentric contraction of the hamstring like I did when I put my hand up and then just lowered down. So you can work the opposite side, triceps to work the biceps in terms of some tension. I'm using the quadriceps to stretch the hamstring a little bit. And when I use the word stretch, I just mean generate tension. And you can do leg extensions to get tension through the hamstring when you can't do an actual hamstring curl. So an easy progression might be is that you start with leg extensions if you can't do any curls. And then you move to where you're on your tummy, like she was before, with a limited range of motion. And then you do full range of motion. And then you do standing hamstring curl. And then you do a standing hamstring curl against resistance. And then you can actually do the Swiss, Swiss ball um, hamstring curls. Have you done those before, where you lay down on your back and bend your knees? Let's try that. So let's have you get on the mat. Put your feet up on the ball. And show me a hamstring curl with the ball. Good. So that's one. Now I want you to do it where you're in a bridge. In a bridge. OK, good. So that's a, a harder. This is a, definitely a harder way to do it because there's resistance. Now we're going to do the super hard way. <laughs> I'm going to help. But the super hard way is come up to a bridge. And you're going to keep the bridge so that the, the angle between here and here and here doesn't change. So as you bend your knees, you're going to come all the way up. And now this becomes like a super duper hard hamstring curl. right? And relax on down. And so we've just gone through a basic progression of easiest to most difficult in terms of general exercise. You OK? Yeah. Did get a cramp? I'm just super sore. <laughs> See, so you're sore. Yeah. How strange we should be having this conversation <laughs> today. <laughs> so stand up. Thank you for your help. Yes, of course. So and I can give you somebody their ball back. The moral of the story is, is with tension is, is to generate the least amount of tension and work your way progressively up to a higher and higher amount of tension as the tissues are healing. That stimulates the healing of the tissues. How many repetitions should you be doing is going to be a question, because I, I would want to know. And the answer is a lot. <laughs> and by a lot, I mean hundreds and hundreds of repetitions. Now, if I said to go to the gym and do any gym-based exercise, I don't even care if it's just doing toe raises or, or just flexing your wrist up and down. Hundreds and hundreds of repetitions with any resistance is probably going to be really, really hard to do. So we're talking about minimal to no tension. The main thing being one, number one, in as big a range of motion as you can. So if you can only do a tiny range of motion, then don't change anything until you can do a bigger and bigger range of motion. Once you've gotten range of motion to where it's normal and full, then you can start to increase the challenge. But start with small range of motion for hundreds and hundreds of repetitions throughout the day, not all at once, unless you've got nothing else to do. <laughs> But you'll start with doing 5 or 10 or 15 or 20. Again, right, pain-free being the key factor here. So you'll do 5, 10, or 15. As soon as it starts feeling fatigued or tired or you feel any discomfort, done, right? no pain. Then a little bit later, after you do what you do, then you'll come back and do some more repetitions and then some more repetitions. And throughout the day, you're trying to accumulate as many hundreds 
if possible, as possible. So that over the course of those two to seven days, seven days, you're just aggregating repetitions, hundreds and hundreds, to where you're getting literally thousands of repetitions over the course of a week or two weeks to create a healing stimulus. So the three T's that we've just gone through, tame it, tape it, and tense it, are what you're gonna do in those first days following the injury to try to maximize the speed of the healing by minimizing the amount of inflammation, which then will reduce the pain and will start to stimulate the healing process in your body. Now I'm gonna give you a warning. One, it, even if you do these things, it might take longer, depending upon the severity of the injury, than you expect it to. What's going on here doesn't listen to what's going on here. Just because you're impatient or you have a race or a competition or a vacation or a whatever, the injured tissue doesn't care. So be patient with yourself. Be patient. It takes as long as it takes. And I can't predict it. I actually went online this morning to see if there's any new information. And I said something like in my Google search, something like, how long does it take for a strain to heal? And this is the answer that pops up over and over again. It varies. It could take anywhere from a couple of days to two months or more. Why didn't they just say it could take as long as it takes? What's this? Why did they say a couple of, why two months? Why did they even put that in there? My experience has been that if it's a very mild strain or irritation, then inside of a week or two, you're back in action, fully back in action. But I've also seen it at the other end of the spectrum where the strains are intense and severe, and it can take literally a year or longer for the tissues to heal, depending upon how badly they're disrupted. It just takes as long as it takes. But if you follow the steps of the process along the way, you're just doing everything that you can to make sure that the process is sped up and not slowed down so that there are no backstops that you're not limiting your progress. Because remember that every time you go back in and disrupt the tissue that was just starting to heal, these little baby fibers that are trying to heal, you're literally starting the process all over again. So you're resetting the clock for those tissues. And that's a big bummer to have to do that after all the work that you've done. So what are the three T's so that we remember them? Does anybody have any specific questions to what we just talked about? Time to tame it and tape it. <coughs> mm -hmm. You feel that if someone's taping, they shouldn't be doing any activity at all? Do you believe in taping for activity? It's a good question, and the answer is, if the activity is pain-free, then it's okay. So if you're putting tape on and you're pain-free, now what I mean by pain-free is, is that the, the minimalized activities, now if you know something bothers you without the tape, it's probably not a good idea to do with the tape. Okay, so you really need to use your brain. It doesn't mean you wanna back off. I mean, the, the key factor here is, is most of us just tend to do too much, but there's also the too little. So these three T's remind you, especially the third one, the tense it, is that you do want to get motion and activity in those tissues to the extent that they're able to tolerate it as soon as possible and as much as possible, but no more than that. So you want to do something more than nothing, but you want to do something less than painful. So it's that pocket of pain-free that's the most important. So if it's pain-free and it's taped, then it's probably okay. Any other questions? Yes. Well, when I have my theories on it, but why someone who's a fast healer compared to a slow healer? What do you think? Why they're a fast healer versus a slow healer? The genetics, nutritional intake. Or yes. Uh, this is, genetics is going to dictate the, the body's ability to heal. It's going to dictate the tissue's t uh, tensile capacities in the first place. Um, the chemical reactions and responses that they have in their body, lifestyle, environment, external and internal stressors, 
um, all of those things, activity levels. Uh, it pay, some people will say, I have a high pain, everybody says, I have a high, right, exactly. I have a high pain tolerance, I have a high pain threshold. And what I tell everybody is, is when they come and see me, they're already in pain, so that's irrelevant. That's like saying, this, is, it, this, this stuff is fire retardant, but it's on fire. <laughs> well, we pass that, whatever the threshold for fire, so it doesn't matter anymore. So that doesn't count once you're, once you're there. So as far as healing is concerned, it's very individual, absolutely. I think that for, uh, for most people, the nutritional component makes a big, big difference, but they don't put the energy into doing it. But you just really have to know thyself and here's a, good, here's a good visual for you in terms of healing. If you've ever had a black and blue, and I mean a bad black and blue, one of those black and blues that literally is black, where it's just a, a nasty black, and then it goes through that process of the weird color change, where then it kind of starts fading, and you get those like blue, purpley, whatever, and then that green, yellowy after a while, like at the edges, and it kind of dissipates. How long does a bad black and blue take to go away? Weeks? Anybody had one last longer than that? Like a black and blue that, and what I mean is, is that when you look at the skin, that yellow is gone. I mean, it's completely, the yellow is gone. It just looks normal. You can't, you go, I don't know where that was. How long does it take for it to go from black, black, black to just normal back on? A month and a half. Anybody else have it any longer? I, I actually, I had a runner's toe which is hysterical because I don't run. <laughs> but I, I, got a, <laughs> I got it from hiking. And I got, I had it, so I had a black and blue underneath my, uh, my big toe of my, my left foot. And it took three months for the discoloration to go away. Three months. It, it hurt the first couple of days, but it took three months for that tissue to, to, to heal and clear, which just lets me know that when I have a bad black and blue, if, the tissue, if I could see it visually and it takes three months, what's going on when I can't see it but it hurts? It's the same thing. It's just what's going on inside. I just can't see it. So if you have a reference point, if you're probably older than 10, then you have a reference point. Everybody here is older than that. I can't insult anybody with that. Then you have reference points of, the, you know, when the last time I got a bruise or a black and blue, it took about this amount of time. It can take a long, long time. So it's very individual. You had a question? Um, yeah. Which, how would you apply that to uh, inflammation caused by broken bones? Broken bones. Yeah, broken Okay, that's a, it's a great question. And so this comes to, I was gonna actually bring up a point, thank you, of differentially diagnosing between a strain and something else. And your something else in that case is definitively a broken bone. In terms of a broken bone, typically if there's enough stress to break the bone, then the tissues in and around the bone probably get hammered as well. So it applies very directly to, to that as well. The tissue healing process is the same. The only problem is, is that since there's an underlying complication of the broken bone and all that other stuff, um, some of the things may or may not apply in terms of the motion, like you might not be allowed to move the area for a certain amount of time because that might affect the healing of the bone, in which case we default to that next worst condition. So if everything's healed, if the bone's healed, the doctor has cleared you and say, okay, you're free to start moving, then all of these things apply 100%. But for, for in terms of if you have pain, sometimes what'll happen is I'll have uh, somebody that'll say, I have a lot of pain in my bicep. And I'll say, well, did you, did you lift anything? Or do you remember having an incident? No, I don't remember having an incident, but it's really sore through my bicep and I've been massaging it and it just really, really hurts. If they can't remember an incident, if they didn't do anything, they didn't fall, they didn't lift anything heavy, they didn't exercise or anything, and there's no good reason for there to be pain there, that's, that's me. That was my reminder to speed things up. <laughs> so I'll speed things up. But it might be coming from somewhere else. And if it's coming from somewhere else, then this stuff might not apply. Somewhere else, for example, might be the shoulder. So shoulder pain can radiate down into the arm. And if you have pain in your arm and you're treating it like a strain of your biceps, but it's not a strain of your biceps, it's a shoulder problem, then the bicep's not gonna get better and you're gonna keep doing things to hurt your shoulder. So if you're unsure, if you don't think that it's a strain or you're not 100% sure that it is a strain, the best thing that you can do is get it diagnosed by somebody that can set, tell you where it's coming from and find out. Because strains typically come from things that we recognize. Last question? Uh, yes, I was wondering about the um, tensit thing. Um, I was wondering if there's a beneficial tempo that you could follow, just like a 2-2-2. Or... Okay, that's a, it's a great question. The question was, is what tempo should you use? It's a great question. Initially, I just go for one second per repetition just to get as many contractions. Because in the beginning, it's not about actually training the muscle through like a time under tension specific thing. 
So isometric contraction is a non-moving, by definition, iso means same length. And actually, if you can't move, if it's all you have at your disposal because there's either pain through motion, which could happen, uh, or you're just unable to get any motion at all, then an isometric contraction where you're getting just a contraction of the muscle is acceptable. But really what we want is some tensile force on it in as many ways as possible. And the isometric contraction is only generating it internally versus getting that stretch. So you're really not stimulating those tissues optimally. And because we're going for the maximum number of repetitions, the time under tension really doesn't come into play. So I would rather you go a little faster and get more repetitions, as long as it's pain-free, than go slower and do the time under tension rule, which is really to stimulate the muscle fibers and create metabolic change inside the muscle fibers. So it's an excellent question. Just get the repetitions down. Later, after the healing happens, then you can start playing with the you know, more aggressive isometrics and time under tension to get that muscle recouped and rehabbed. But re initially, we're just trying to get those disrupted tissues recouped and rehabbed. I think we're out of time. I don't want to run any bit over. I'm going to stick around afterwards if anybody has any questions. But I thank you so much for your attention.